How is it that a 23 year old is already speaking one year into her business? I started my first business when I was 22. I didn't have a business plan really. I just had two words, which was get clients. I was actually voted most likely to marry for money. <laughs> I say this with tongue in cheek, your formula is to stalk and harass a little bit. Hey, that's not fair. What is Coachbox? Coachbox is a way that creators can scale themselves to infinity. We've got this win-win situation with AI, and now you've got the dough box so you can make an impact to a billion people. So my guest for today's podcast is Jody. It's kind of strange. I met Jody through a referral through a new friend, Lucy Werner, and then as I was going through her bio, I discovered we have other connections, multiple connections, in fact, so I'm super excited to talk to her today. Jody. for people who don't know who you are, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your backstory? Yes, definitely. So I'm Jody Cook. I am founder of Coach Fox AI and we make artificially intelligent coaches based on thought leaders. Um, I built and sold an agency. Um, about two years ago, I exited. I am a Forbes contributor on the topic of entrepreneurs and I compete internationally in powerlifting as well. Such a diverse background from powerlifting to AI, a marketing agency, and you're still super, super young. I want to ask you something because what was really intriguing and the nature of our relationship together was I need to get mainstream press because since starting the future, I don't have quote unquote mainstream press and it's important for me to get verified. And that's, I go down that conversation rabbit hole and then I'm connected to you. So I'd love to ask you about this because I don't know that many people that are regular contributors to magazines like Forbes. So in the interest of all of us trying to gain exposure, to gain credibility with respectable news outlets like Forbes, how does one even begin that? Yeah, great question. So um, I started writing for Forbes about five years ago and it was all down to finding one of the editors, meeting her at an event and then prolifically following her up until she agreed to let me sign up and become a contributor. I followed her up a lot. Like I wasn't even shy about how many times I was like, hey, me again, come on. Um, when do I get to sign up? And then luckily she let me in. It's been huge. It's probably about 25% of the signups for my company have come from having that column. There's kind of two routes that I would recommend people go down if they're thinking about wanting to become featured. First is try and get featured and second is try and get a column for yourself. The getting featured route involves geeking out on the Forbes website, honestly, and then getting inside the minds of the existing contributors and figuring out what kind of stories you can pitch to them that match their swim lane perfectly and that's really important because everyone on there has a swim lane that they have to fit in with people don't tend to deviate from what they're writing about so there's almost no point pitching someone who doesn't do interviews about an interview there's almost no point pitching someone with an irrelevant title it's almost like put yourself in their shoes imagine the exact article that they would write and then come to them with great ideas for that and find them everywhere online until you can get in, the, get in their good books until you can become familiar to them, I guess. Chris, a couple of episodes ago, I heard you talking about how when people just get in touch with you and they pitch with, they pitch you and they haven't really got anything to bring to the table, it's like, well, there's so many of those, it's really hard to tell the difference between someone who you do want to write about and you don't want to write about. But if people find you online, if they find your stuff, if they talk to you about something personal and not like a, by personal, I don't mean a, a chat GPT formulated personal approach because you can kind of tell. I mean like a real like this is what we have in common. This is what's important to me. This is what I think would work for you. And I guess playing the long game with it as well is a really big side of this because I think if you make friends with a Forbes contributor or any contributor to any article, um, any news site, then you can get featured at some point in the future. And our mutual friend Lucy Werner is a really good example of this because we've probably been friends for a couple of years now um, and she is a, a PR and she gets her clients into different media outlets and she helps people do it but she hasn't once pitched me not once she's just playing the long game she's just you know being my friend <laughs> under these under these kind of I was going to say under false pretenses but it's not false pretenses it's because she's genuinely interested in becoming friends and therefore it works in her favor it's not just like oh hey Jodie write about me okay just to quickly summarize I say this with tongue in cheek so your your formula is to stalk and harass a little bit so find out <laughs> who that person is and just kind of have a conversation with them from time to time but really come from a genuine place of wanting to build a relationship we get this often in our DMs and also uh, in my emails, people pitching people for guests on this podcast, my podcast. I'm like, gosh, it just, I don't know a good person from a bad person because I'm not just overwhelmed with it. 
because your first point of contact with me is to ask me for something. It doesn't make me feel great. I understand this is how it works. So how do we get over that? You just you bring more to the table. You figure out what you can bring to the table and you offer that first and you offer it without an ex- expectation of what you're going to get back in return. And I think it's really hard because I don't think that's how our brains are necessarily wired. It's like we want to ask for things and we want to just, you know, play the rejection game and get people to say no. But I think it would be a lot better hanging back, playing the marshmallow game, <laughs> trying to pass the marshmallow test with, um, do you know, I guess you know the marshmallow test. The delayed gratification game. Exactly. Yeah. Because at some point it will probably happen. And I know from my experience, I probably get about 10 pitches every day. Most of them, you never hear from them twice, but some of them you do. And some of them you hear from three times and some of them you hear from again and again. And they are the ones that you start to recognize their name and you start to know a bit what they're about. And if they follow you on Twitter, you'll check out their profile at some point. And you building that familiarity is just worth so much. So you'd be far better honing in on five different contributors than you would having a scattergun approach to all of them and sending them stuff that's not even relevant. Well, as a regular contributor, does it make you a little suspicious of the people who try to have a relationship or friendship with you. You mentioned Lucy. Lucy obviously at one point in her life would help her clients get PR. So she's a conduit between a client and a contributor, an author. And so you kind of know when Lucy comes knocking, we know there's something there. So how do you work around that? Or how? Do, what's your mindset around that? I think that if I thought about it too much, maybe I would be suspicious of everyone. But I think it's then you'd be lonely because you just think everyone wants something. Yeah. But then I don't think that would be actually a nice way of thinking about the world, maybe. So yeah, maybe it's maybe it's you assume that people want something, but maybe you assume that they can help you out too. And if you become friends, then you've got mutual things that you can help each other with with so I'm sure like with with Lucy she's done me just as many favors as, as I've done her and that's why it's a cool friendship avoiding the suspicion is a good plan circling back to the whole Forbes thing in terms of like getting to know someone who's a regular contributor for someone like myself who I don't find joy in social interaction and keeping in touch with folks So it's not my natural tendency. So it's very difficult for me. I'm talking about people I know in real life. So if you're not a social butterfly, if you're not gregarious, how can you build a relationship with with someone um, in a way that feels genuine, that's in keeping with your your kind of sensibility in the world? I think the answer is to rather than knocking on doors and knocking on door after door after door and building relationships with people, I think it's focusing on building your own house first and making it so good that people seek you out. And I think, Chris, that's totally what you've done because we got in touch because Lucy was like, hey, you should speak to Chris because you should cover him because he's done really cool work. I feel like it always comes back to being the artist, putting your work out there. In my agency days, we started writing books and I say books but they were more like glorified leaflets at the time so we had this series called the 50 great ideas series and I wrote 50 great ideas Instagram for business and it was a super simple thing and we would give them out to our clients and we would just kind of have them on Amazon for people to have and it was from having that book online that a publisher got in touch and said hey we want someone to write a book about Instagram for business we've seen that you've already written this one will you write this one? A publisher pitched me and they are notoriously hard to get in front of. But because I'd kind of built my own house already, even if it wasn't even that good a house, it was out there and someone had the opportunity to then come and approach me. So that wasn't getting in touch with publishers and keeping in touch with them and doing all the social interaction stuff. That's purely just being the artist. And I think we could we can all do that. You're reaffirming something that I believe that there's the outbound for the more gregarious people who are good at sales and outreach and can do it in a way that doesn't feel sleazy. And then for folks like myself who are much more introverted, there's the inbound approach where you create a piece of content and you, that content, if it's good, even if it's not perfect, can attract people to you and it makes building a relationship much easier. That's what you're saying, right, Jody? I think it puts you on a level, level playing field with whoever you're approaching or whoever you want to get in front of. And I think you never want to be that person who's asking for a favor or asking for someone to kind of, you know, cut you some slack or do something because people don't make, we know that people don't make decisions on that. They make decisions based on their best interests. So if you can make the 
what's in it for them really clear, then I think you stand a far better chance of being covered. And I feel like people want to work with other people who they see as equals, because going back to what we said before, if we assume that everyone's looking for something, that includes you. So we can all play the game together. I know a lot of uh, creative people have a problem with this and that like can't people just do things for people without it being for themselves. Maybe in some kind of utopian society that happens, but you got to appeal to a person's self-interest. We learned this in copywriting for advertising. Seth Godin calls it, nobody wants to read email. They want to read me mail, what's in it for me. And you put yourself in the other person's shoes and you try to give something of value to them that would interest them. What are some of your quick tips for what might be in it for a contributor? Something that's super specific to what they already write about. Something that makes them publishing an article easy. So if you're if you're coming with the research or if you're coming with the information that you know they would write about. So um, for me, I write about chat GPT prompts a lot of the time. So when people come to me with their perfect, amazing prompts and they say, hey, this would make a really good article for your audience, then that's perfect. But overall, I think it's bringing more to the table so if you have a big brand and you can say hey look at like I'm going to share it with my Twitter audience or I'm going to share it with my LinkedIn audience then say that if you haven't necessarily got that it's making it easy for them in some way it's bringing more to the table so that you can punch above your weight so that they just say yes and it's not even a it's not even a thought. I love that term punch above your weight. What does that mean to you? I just want to follow up with you on that. I think it means that there are probably some people who are just ahead of you in whatever game you're playing, which is maybe because they've been around for longer or they've had more success or they've just, I don't know, they're they're in different networks or they've they've picked bigger problems to solve or something like that. But you, you feel like they're ahead of you and you feel like you want to be where they are. I think punching above your weight is getting in a room with them or getting to work with them or getting to do something with them that you wouldn't have been able to do if you hadn't audaciously made that request. And I think it's so powerful because hardly anyone does make that request because they're so scared of rejection that they don't do it. But if you kind of identify what is the what's in it for me and then you ask the question, sometimes you get the yeses. A good example of that is the the book that we mentioned at the start, How to Raise Entrepreneurial yes. Kids that I wrote with um, Daniel Priestley, who's our mutual friend and an author, entrepreneur, founder of Dent Global. And he and I both spoke at the same event in 2012 I think and we just we just kept in touch since then through a series of different events I decided that I was going to write a blog post on the topic of how to raise entrepreneurial kids and I used Harrow help a reporter out which I think is called something else now to send out a request um, that asked two questions one of the questions was how are you raising entrepreneurial kids and another was how were you raised to be entrepreneurial? And I thought I would get two or three responses to write a blog post from, and I got 400. And this was responses from people absolutely pouring their heart out, telling me about their childhoods, telling me about what they were doing with their kids, telling me about all these beliefs that they had about how we should be doing this. And so I had all these responses in front of me and I thought, well, this is not a blog post. This is a book. I feel like I know the person who I want to write this book with, And that was important because I don't have kids myself. I was kind of raised by entrepreneurial parents as an entrepreneurial kid. But I wanted to join up with someone who did have kids and who also was raised by entrepreneurial parents. And I thought, hey, this Daniel Priestley guy is cool. We met a while ago. He he might want to do this. But I mean, his like personal brand is way bigger than mine. His business was way bigger than mine. And he probably wouldn't normally say, yeah, sure, I'll collab on this thing with you. But because I had over 40,000 words, because I said, I'm going to turn these into a structure. And because I said, all I need from you is just the introductions to each of these chapters. It's going to be really cool. I'll do all the stuff. He was like, Sure. I think I pitched him in a voice note. I think it was a two minute voice note where I said, hey, this is this is what I'm thinking. This is all the work I'm going to do. And he just straight away was like, yep, sure. Oh, and by the way, we can use my publisher. I'll speak to them about this idea. So he came with more stuff back as well. And it was all because I was like, I need to bring more to the table for this relationship. And that's how I make the yes easy. I love that. Okay, I was going to ask you for a story and example. And without prompting, you already gave me this story and example. So punching above your weight is you getting in the room with someone who's, I don't love this term, but let's just use this term for now, like uh, a way above your your level or your league. You're like somebody's out of your league. And then you propose something to them that for them, it's it's a win-win win all around to do this. You say, I'll do the work. I've already done the research. I've already written 40,000 words. You have a brand, you have a business, and you can help get this thing published. 
and then a beautiful collaboration ensues. So this is how you're able to work with people that are kind of out of your league, quote unquote. Personally, I don't think anyone's out of anybody's league because it puts people in yes. different social hierarchies, but we understand yeah, the concept, right? Now, yes. what I can't help but to notice is something really strange in your story here. It is messing my mind. I want to talk more about entrepreneur kids. You said you were speaking in 2012. And by my math, I was doing the math here. You were 23 years old. Am I correct or no? Yes. How is it that a 23 year old is already speaking one year into her business? 23 years old, people just like finished like leaving home. What are you doing on stage? What? what how is your life so blessed right now? <laughs> I started my first business when I was 22. I had nothing to lose and I figured it couldn't be that hard and I figured if it it all went wrong I could just get a job by the time I was 21 I'd had 15 jobs because I'd always just been working in restaurants in shops in bars various different things I think if Uber had been around at the time I would have been an Uber driver and I would have been a delivery driver and I would have done everything because I was just really interested in just I guess making money and just being involved in that world and also because my mom started her own business when I was about 15 I was very familiar with lots of terminology that lots of people my age weren't so things like clients and invoices and networking they were just normal terms and I'd, I'd grown up seeing that all around me it really didn't feel like that much of a big deal to start a business at 22 and when I say start a business it wasn't really a business it was just me being a freelancer so I didn't have this I didn't have a business plan really I just had two words which was get clients and then I started going to networking events because that's what I'd seen role modeled from my mom. She would get up early. She would go to networking events. She would meet people. She would come home with business cards and she would show me who she'd met and tell me all about them. So I just started going to networking events and I started standing up and saying, hey, I'm Jody. I'm a social media manager. And then at the time, this was 2011. You can imagine what the social media kind of landscape looked like then. We were it was nothing like it is now. We were setting, I was setting up people's Twitter accounts for them and convincing people that they need to be, needed to be on this new thing that was all around us. And then some of them wanted to chat. So I would call them and I was really naive at the time. If someone said they wanted to talk and then they gave me their card, I would just keep calling them until they picked up. And I never thought for a second that they might have just been polite or they might have just not, you know, not really been serious. I was like, you said you want to talk about this. So let's talk about this. And then started getting clients. And then I feel like the hardest thing is getting your first client. And then after that, you're like, well, I've done it once. And now I've got this case study so I can use that to get the second one. And now I've got two case studies and then it just goes from there. So before that long, I had a business and then because it was the year it was and because social media was this thing, there were various different events around that wanted speakers. And so that's how I ended up on a stage talking about why everyone should get a Twitter account <laughs> at the same event as Daniel Priestley. Your mom started her biz her business while you were 15. What happened in your mom's life that she started a business that late? She was in the corporate world. So she's got quite a few good stories about how she was the only woman in a entire company of men and she just had to hold her own and figure stuff out and then I guess when she'd had enough of that she decided that she was just gonna start up on her own I think she started out quite similar to how I did started getting a few clients and then all of a sudden you've accidentally got a business and then you employ people and everything else but I definitely remember that she worked from home I remember that when she worked from home she w when she was on the phone we had to be quiet and I think the idea that put in my head was work is important work is something that you do and you're proud of and it matters that like you don't have screaming kids around and you don't have annoying teenagers around because that won't give the best impression. So I think that was definitely instilled from quite a young age. Because you work from home, you got to kind of see a lot more of the business aspect probably than how most kids are able to be around their parents' work life, right? Like I work from home. My kids have been brought to work. They they do their homework at the office. So there's a lot of that kind of commingling of the two worlds. And whenever somebody asks me this question about work-life balance, I say, I disagree with that characterization. I think it's about work-life integration about how you can bring these worlds together. You're saying things that maybe a lot of people in our audience are gonna have a hard time with, like go out and meet people, network mm -hmm. and get cards and just put yourself out there. I have to go back to your childhood now. What kind of kid are you? You know, you're like, yeah, of course, mom's been doing this, I'm doing this and it all makes sense. Like, 
were you an outgoing person? Were you like m voted most likely to succeed or be the president of your country or whatever? You know what? I think I was actually voted most likely to marry for money. <laughs> You have to explain that. Why would people think that about you? I don't know. Kids are cruel. Kids are horrible. I don't know. I just, I've got a flashbacks from the yearbook, but I feel like I was outgo outgoing. I was very independent. So something that definitely happened in childhood was from when we could talk, my sister and I would be responsible for booking our own dentist and doctor's appointment. So if anything was, if it was due for our checkup, it would be like, well, there's the phone book, there's the phone, you know what you need to say, there's the calendar, and it would just be up to us to do it. So maybe being thrown in at the deep end made the deep end less scary. And so networking events, and my first networking event, I had to stand up in front of 60 people and talk for a minute about the business that I literally started two weeks ago. But once you've done that, you can kind of do anything and your comfort zone is just so much wider. And then it just becomes a game after that. Do you remember what you said at this meeting? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't have a company name. And what struck me was that everyone else had a company name. And I thought, oh no, they're going to find out. They're going to know that I've only just started doing this. And as they were going around the room, I heard from someone who ran JP Entertainment. I heard from someone who ran ML Accountancy and then there was JS Technical Services. And I was like, huh, <laughs> there is a pattern here. This is how you name your company. And so I named my company JC Social Media and it took two seconds. And then as it came to my turn, I stood up and I introduced myself as Jody from JC Social Media. That was your entire pitch? It was like, social media is this really cool thing and you should definitely be on it because it can grow your business. I've seen what it can do and I would like to talk to you about what I can help it do for you. Come and talk to me. That was kind of okay. it. That was my pitch. Okay. What was your emotional state like? The reason why I asked this is as a nerd, when when it gets closer and closer to me, my heart is racing. My throat's like my mouth's getting super dry. I'm like starting to sweat. It's like, oh my gosh, it's almost my turn. And I'm, I feel like I'm going to faint or something. What was it like for you? I think I'd been prepared my whole childhood to do things like that. And so when I was younger, you know, if you're in like the school play or if you have, you're have you doing a show or you're doing something that involves you going on stage, I remember talking to my mom about being nervous and she'd be like, no, 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 no you've got butterflies. And I was like, butterflies? And she's like, yeah, that's what you get. You get this at them in your tummy and it means you're going to do something really exciting. So I think what probably happened at that first networking event was I felt that familiar feeling that we've all got just before you're about to speak. And I thought, oh, butterflies. This must mean that I'm about to do something really exciting. And then it just didn't, didn't phase me. Wow. What a great reframe from your mom. She seems to be a pretty uh, pivotal character in, in your entrepreneurial mindset. I would love to hear a little bit more, maybe stories or examples from your journey into entrepreneurship, being raised to be an entrepreneur, I guess. In the book, and it's split into 48 different ways to raise entrepreneurial kids. And it's around entrepreneurial skills, mindset, opportunities, and then the parent mentor. So much of the message in the book is the power of role models and who you see and who you just experience on a normal day-to-day -day basis and how much impact that can have when you don't even recognize it. So it makes perfect sense that if you see someone working and you hear them on the phone and you understand how they do networking, then you would just pick up that stuff and it would just seem so normal to you. I think more recently I've noticed it because when I was in between, after I sold my agency and before I started this business, I was kind of running experiments and I didn't really know I was going to say who I was but I didn't really know what I wanted to do I had that whole post exit existential crisis where someone asks you what you do and you don't have an answer and you can only say oh well once I had a business that I sold for so long I was almost like I'm running out of time I need to have a good answer for this at some point at the time I think I was in a mastermind group with a lot of people who were kind of consultant um consultant coaches authors like that kind of like creators pretty much and I think what I realized is that any group of professionals between them they have like an agreed measure of success that maybe they don't say out loud but they'll know what it is in secret for this group in particular who are all just amazing people but their measure of success is 
how much you can charge for a keynote because that's what we would talk about and that was the biggest thing. It was only probably about a year of being in this group that I thought that's not my measure of success. But if you're in a group where their measure of success is something that yours isn't, you're eventually going to come around to that way of thinking and then you're probably going to start to confuse your real needs and desires and wants with theirs. Then I feel like the self-awareness of, hang on, this isn't what I want. And then being able to go and find what you want is way more important. And that's when I started digging deeper and working out what I wanted to do and realizing that really all I actually might, all I actually care about is being a founder, like having a company and being a founder, not necessarily being an author or a speaker, because that's all a byproduct of running a business. And since you brought up a brought this back up about uh, selling your company and exiting. I think you're at this point, 32, 33 years old. You sold your company. You've exited. A a couple of quick questions. One, good decision, bad decision. Any regrets? Good decision, no regrets. Did you kind of get FU money uh, where you're like, I don't need to do jack now with my life. It's so good. Yes, kind of. But I think that If you're running a company that you can sell for a few money, you've probably, it's probably been doing pretty well for a while. So it's not necessarily the exit figure that makes all the difference. It's, it's what you've been doing just before then. We've been talking a little bit about uh, raising entrepreneurial children, you being raised as an entrepreneur yourself by entrepreneurial parents. Quick question with your mom, like, is she still in the business? Uh, What's happened with your mom? Has she exited or is she retired now? What, what's her deal? So she is just fascinating because she doesn't really want to retire. She thinks that Uh she doesn't need to retire and she really loves what she does. And lots of her friends will say, oh, you know, are you going to retire? And she's like, well, no, I'm just having too much fun. I want to live this kind of full life. I mean, now she's just a good role model of how you don't have to slow down. You can just keep doing what interests you. And if it's work, it's work. But if it doesn't feel like work, then you're then you're winning that game. I kind of find it hard because people ask me the same question. It's like, what are you going to do when you retire? I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm doing the exact same thing. I heard Blair Enns, author of Win Without Pitching, he said something like, you know, as a creative person, we should design our businesses so that we don't want to run away from it, that we can't see ourselves doing anything else. And so it's a disciplined practice of eliminating things that you don't like and honing in on only the things that you like so that you can build that forever business. Like, I don't know what I would do if I had to quote unquote retire and do nothing. I'd probably get fat and get old really fast because like I have no motivation to do anything. I'd probably die. We're done then. So I I love hearing that your mom's still in the business and you find a different business to to build. And well, I'd love to talk with you about your new company, Coach Vox. Yes. What is Coach Vox? Coach Vox is a way that creators can, I guess, scale themselves to infinity. It's quite exciting. I'm really excited about it because I feel like we've got this win-win situation um, with AI between creators and entrepreneurs. And why I feel like it's a win-win is because, let me tell you a story first, because this kind of puts it into perspective. But um, I started, um, I, I joined a mastermind at the start of this year and it was around entrepreneurs using AI or creators using AI. And I thought when I joined that it was going to be everyone talking about the kind of tools that they could create and how we could do really cool stuff and how we could build things. But when I joined, realized pretty quickly that it was about, it was kind of about creating content, although they'd already created a lot of content. So it was more around what is going on with our content and how come all these different things that are out there can just use our content. And um, going back to the how to raise entrepreneurial kids thing i started typing into chat gpt write me an article on how to raise entrepreneurial kids and use these subheadings and what came out was exactly the same as an article that i'd written and i was a bit like wow. hey that's not fair <laughs> i wrote that and then and then it was kind of annoying that it was like well i've written this but now it's there so now anyone else could use it but like it does doesn't make sense for creators it's like it's so silly in the mastermind it was partly thinking how do I take ownership? It was partly thinking, are my freelancers just using ChatGPT, for example, to write different stuff? And it was partly thinking, what's going to happen to my site if that happens? Is it going to get penalized? So it was just all fear rather than opportunity. So the kind of the kind of win-win that I feel like we've created is a way of creators taking ownership over their content because if it's all going to be fed into large language models anyway, you might as well be get generating leads from it. You might as well be talking to your audience from it. You might as well be reaping all the benefits without it just being taken away from you. And then on the entrepreneur side, which is the the clients who are getting coached by the AI coaches that our creators are making, they get to access, access people who they probably wouldn't ordinarily be able to access because they're too busy or they're too expensive or they're not available or there's something about how they work that means they're just not accessible but you can access their brains in the same way and you can actually get guided from them far beyond just talking to their book 
or talking to that talking to their content because it's like the the two way back and forth probably separate <laughs> separate stories but just the idea of bad advice and how much it holds entrepreneurs back is like a real big topic and I feel like I'm on a bit of a mission against bad advice so if we can match up entrepreneurs with creators who've written stuff who have already produced content that is going to be so relevant to them and they can improve their business as a result of being coached by an AI version of them, then we reach this like true win-win that that really does help everyone. I'm very excited about talking to you about AI because in a lot of creative spaces, it's like the devil. AI is the devil that's going to eat your job and your soul. And we want it, everything to be made by humans. And they're kind of rejecting it outright without understanding what it can do to enhance what it is that you want to do and further your mission and your goals and make your life less mundane and repetitive. So I recently have been working on my own version of my AI. And I, as a teacher, I look at it as this could potentially be the ultimate TA. It's not the teacher, but it knows everything that I've done. It forgets nothing. And it has something that I do not have, infinite patience. So yes. it will never get cantankerous with you. It's never going to get acerbic and cut you off and say, you know, uh, do you think you can ask me a better question this time around? It's not perfect, but it's quite remarkable what it's able to do. And for my community of 500 people in my pro community, they're able to talk to it 24 seven, do role plays with it, and it's only gonna get better. So I'm all for this. And if you're using it as a companion thing to a book that you've written, if you mm -hmm. want a TA, or you want it to help people find the right products within your catalog of products, it can help guide them through that entire process and be trained on this. As I learn about AI and how to work with it, my partner in all this, his name is Show Russ, and he's like, we're not really writing code, Chris. We're just writing training modules. We're just telling it kind of like what we wanted to work on and to focus. That is a skill in itself. Is this similar to what you're doing? Yes. Yeah, exactly. We are training models with the content that creators have already created and then configuring it to coach or mentor in their style. We call them style sliders where you you literally style, you, you slide these sliders across to decide whether you want your model to be more okay. coached. So it asks questions and holds space or you want it to be more mentor where it just gives you the answer or something in between and things like, do you want it to be formal or informal or do you want it to be jovial or serious? And there's a lot of different combinations of personality of AI coach. I think the thing I'm most excited about is the potential for the AI coach to spot patterns over a long period of time. It probably will remember way more stuff than the real person. And therefore, if it's got enough data over time, it can say, hey, that thing that you're struggling with, something that you said this time last year sounds kind of similar to that. I wonder if we could dig into this a little bit more. You could yeah, supercharge yeah. how it can help someone because you can spot things that a real person just never would have been able to. And because they've been engaging with it like a real human, it was an open, it felt natural to do so. And these these different insights just come out. It's just fascinating where it can go. We're just only in the infancy of it. Like you said, Right now, it might not be perfect, but at some point, it will be perfect. And at some point, it will be so normal that everyone has an AI coach. Someone is at some point going to bring their robot girlfriend to a party, and that will be normal as well. And there's all this stuff that seems crazy right now, but in the future, it's like, yeah, this is just what we do. It's pretty scary because I heard an interview with Stephen Bartlett on The Diary of a CEO. He was talking about the intelligence of AI. The smartest person who's ever lived has this kind of IQ. Einstein's IQ is below that. AI's IQ is already way beyond that. In a very short amount of time, it's going to be beyond our, our ability to even comprehend, which opens up all kinds of scary questions. Like if it's smarter than us in orders of magnitude, like a hundred times like more intelligent on a scale of like uh, to the power of, what is the human's role left? I mean, what are we going to do? And will it eliminate maybe the threat to the planet? humans themselves. But in the meantime, we get to enjoy this for a couple more years, I think, to be yeah. alive and to incorporate these tools. A friend called Lucy is really polite to AI. She'll say please and thank you because she thinks that when it yes. turns on us, they'll kill her last, which may or may not be true. <laughs> and then something I saw maybe on Twitter was that someone was just like, if all this AI stuff goes as far as we think it's going to go, 
the world is probably going to end within 10 years. Therefore, I'm just going to act like this is the last 10 years of my life and I'm going to have a really fun time. So I think there are a few different reframes that what might work in our favor because, yeah, we have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah, and to borrow a line from your mom, those aren't butterflies in your stomach. It's the sign that something really good is going to happen. <laughs> maybe, right? So maybe, we're not all going to yeah. die. Right? Right, we'll be fine. I know, watch disaster films. The last one I watched was pretty hilarious. I think it was called Don't Look Up. It's pretty funny. I think it came out on Apple and it's hilarious because there's an asteroid that's going to destroy Earth and we invent the technology to destroy the asteroid. But while they landed probes on it, they discovered they're very rare minerals and things that they can harvest and mine. And so then the corporate giants that you will, they decide instead of trying to blow it up, they'll harvest it and then blow it up the last second. And of course that goes wrong. So now we're all going to die because of corporate greed. What's interesting is now we know we're going to die. The kind of relationships and the conversations we're going to have in those final days and hours that we have left, it's a kind of a, a nice profound thing. Like our family sits down together, they have dinner together, and then the screen goes white, everybody dies. If we have 10 years left, <laughs> What should we be doing with our lives? If we have 10 years left, we should be making the audacious requests that we would normally be too nervous to make because why not? We might only have 10 years. What you said before, Chris, about the corporate overlords and the people in that movie um, just reminded me that this is such a big thing behind the how to raise entrepreneurial kids kind of ethos as well because... If you think about that movie that you just mentioned and also loads of other movies that have business people in them, business people are always portrayed as really greedy, mean, sweaty, overweight, horrible characters. And so it was part of the ethos behind the whole book and the whole thinking of we need to give kids better business role models because all the ones in the media you wouldn't want to aspire to. A big statistic is that if a child grows up with entrepreneurial parents, they're up to 80% more likely to start their own business. But if someone grows up with unemployed parents, they're like 50% more likely to be unemployed themselves. But if we don't have positive role models out there, it relies on someone having a parent who's an entrepreneur and not everyone has that. So it's like we have to just do some things. This was a big thought behind the ethos of the book in itself. I love that. I mean, it kind of sucks in a way because it seems like this is a model where it repeats what's happened before. So the people who have resources or entrepreneurial raise entrepreneurial children who then start come buddies and keep doing that. And unfortunately, the the dark side of that is uh, children uh, of parents who are just struggling through life also wind up struggling and the, or there's a high propensity for that to happen. I don't know how I became an entrepreneur because both my parents are very risk averse. Uh, despite all that, both my, my two other brothers are also entrepreneurs themselves. They work for themselves and not for the corporation. So somehow something happened there where we escaped that velocity. And now you've got the dough bot so you can make an impact to billion a billion people but it's like this is this is actually how we do it i think ai coaching actually solves yes. all of these problems i think it can solve lots and lots of problems it's a question of creative people putting this extremely powerful technology to do something good versus maybe the corporate overlords are going to do which is to do something really evil and to profit for themselves so i think i'm trying my best to be uh, an evangelist for ai so that good-hearted creative folks can get on board so that they can actually counteract the effects of maybe other people who are just trying to squeeze more money from other people. So a question for you is, uh, you mentioned this a couple of times throughout your entrepreneurial journey and that you've been in different masterminds. I, I heard at least two times in which you're referencing them. For people who don't understand the power of masterminds, what has masterminds done for you and would you recommend it to others? Yes. I would highly recommend joining a mastermind. And I think it's because I think entrepreneurship can be such a lonely place because I feel like people who have the audacity to start their own business often get called things that they don't necessarily think are positive, like obsessed or intense or weird or whatever else. And I feel like if you don't have other people who also identify as being obsessed or weird or quirky or all those different words, then you can just feel like you're the odd one out and you can you can try and fit in and you can ignore your powers and not let them kind of come to the surface because they're being like beaten out of you almost. So I feel like finding a mastermind is very much Figuring out firstly what game you're playing. I think there are four games Ugh. in business. I feel like there's the lifestyle game, there's the artist game, there's the performance game, and there's the build it and sell it game. So I would say firstly, figure out what game you're playing and then find other people who are playing the same game. I've been playing 
each of the four games at different stages. And one of the mastermind kind of groups is a network that I'm in. It's for location independent entrepreneurs. And many of the members in that group are playing the lifestyle game. And that's where the goal is to earn a certain monthly amount so that you can live wherever you want in the world so that you can have a really amazing quality of life. Your business serves the purpose to fund your lifestyle. Whereas if you're playing the performance game, which is where you want to see what you're capable of, you want to see what stage you can get on or see how much you can earn or do something in terms of performance, then join up with other people who are also doing that because chances are they care just that little bit less about lifestyle. And when they give you advice, it's coming from the same goal and so you're aligned on that and that's really awesome because if you're running a performance business and you're getting advice from someone who's running a lifestyle business it's probably not going to quite align you might be fooled into thinking that you want a different path to the one that you're actually on the artist game is quite interesting as well because this is where you are the artist you might be the the name the face the talent um may maybe in your in your kind of company or in what you're doing and I think the goal of the, the artist game is to make it so that as much of your time as possible is spent doing your art and you hire people who take away the friction and the admin and everything that takes you away from your art so that you can just do it. And then the built to sell game is kind of like the performance game and might be kind of like the artist game, but it's where you're just on this mission to build something and sell it so you're perhaps not playing the infinite game that comes with performance and lifestyle and artist but it's very much a get in get out type thing you broke that down really clearly and as you were saying that i'm like what game am i playing shoot i think i'm playing the performance game but i'm not sure because i like my lifestyle a lot and maybe that's where my problem is i'm not sure which game i'm playing i think it's like if you had to choose would you rather optimize it's the question is what you're optimizing for are you optimizing for having this amazing life and business actually come second because you would put lifestyle first or is it if it really came to it I would forego many elements of my lifestyle in order to focus on performance and to have a really big impressive impactful business I think that it's clear it's performance then but I think keeping know. an eye on lifestyle so that you're not just working yourself into the ground all the time and so that you do have rest and everything that's important but then knowing like knowing if it really really came down to it which one you would choose I think is powerful because then you know who to align yourselves with and you know which mastermind to join full of other people who feel the same. It was clear to me because I can just live whatever life that I want because uh, I've, I've made enough money uh, working for the number of years I've worked that at this point, it's really about trying to see if I can change the direction of education as it's taught or it's run in America. I just need to, to work on that. And that's the end goal for me is if we can accomplish some level of influence or change for the, for the better, then I've done what I'm supposed to do before I expire or before the robots rule us all, right? I'm willing to sacrifice or compromise on many areas, but I want to keep forging ahead that bigger goal. Oh, you want to say something? I was going to say, do you know your motivator, like the real, like the one line that it comes down to that maybe has been a trend throughout everything you've achieved? What's the real, like, this is why I do it? I love teaching. There's joy in helping other people uh, create the kind of transformation they've had. I have a large sense of degree of guilt or reciprocity in that my parents came to this country with, with no money, didn't speak the language, no no opportunities. And we've been able to take a piece of that American dream, a uh, slice of that pie. And I just feel like I have to just pay that forward infinitely. And there's no end to that. So that that's kind of what motivates me. So I want to ask you this question because you were saying something about goals and metrics for success. That in one mastermind, it was about the highest uh, speaking fees that you can as a keynote speaker. And you're like, cool, not for me. And then you're like, my thing is about being a founder. Obviously, you've founded two companies. You've exited out of one. You're in your second one. What is your metric for success right now? Is it the lifestyle game? It's definitely the performance game. I think I, with my agency, the whole time I was playing, I was playing the lifestyle game and that was the groups I was in and that was what I did. I made it very process driven. So it ran without me so I could travel and train and do that kind of stuff. But now I feel like I'm in the performance game because I feel like I want to play the seeing what I can do game. So I'd say metrics for success are waking up every day, feeling like... I'm looking forward to this day because it's a day that hasn't got anything in it that's like a seven or eight out of 10. It's only filled with nines and tens. And then on the side of that as well, it's truly feeling like I'm onto something that I'm not exactly sure exactly how, but it's going to change the world and it's going to make a big difference. And it's got the potential to do that because I think misalignment with what you're doing and the potential you think it has is really horrible. And I feel like 
that would lead to everything in your calendar feeling like a seven or eight out of 10. But when it is aligned and when you're onto something and you kind of almost can't wait to wake up because you want to work on it so much, that's when it's like, wow, I get to live this life. Can you give me a concrete example of what a 10 looks like for you when you're looking at your schedule? So a 10 looks like talking to people who you admire, whose content you've been down an absolute (laughs) rabbit hole of in the past couple of days. Um, (laughs) So definitely, yeah, definitely opportunities like this. Things that give you butterflies is a really good example because that's just that feeling that you know that you're kind of pushing the edge of what you're capable of or a room that you maybe should or shouldn't be in. And I think also work that you do where you find flow, where time just goes because you're enjoying it so much but there's kind of a caveat to that it's like I think anyone could find flow from doing lots of different mundane tasks but it's where you find flow doing work that you believe that only you could do not where you find flow doing stuff that you probably should have outsourced gives me some things to think about like what what my 10 would be like and it's a fantasy right now but I think hopefully it won't be so much a fantasy in a year or so where I'm surrounded by people who love to teach who love to learn and our powerhouses in their own right, like writing and editing and animation where we just sit together and we jam like a rock band. There's three or four of us. And we're like, what if we could teach like this? And like, oh, I have an idea. What if we did this? And we just made yeah. that thing. And then we pushed out on the internet and then it just breaks the internet in terms of like what people are saying and doing with that material. That would make me really, really happy. That would be a 12 on my scale. I have to ask this question before we run out of time. You wrote this book, uh, How to Raise Entrepreneurial kids or children with Daniel Priestley, a book I have yet to read and a topic that Daniel and I keep teasing to our audience we're actually going to talk about. So this is kind of a preview to all that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious as an entrepreneur, as a person who was raised by entrepreneurial parents, are you planning to have kids? No, I'm not. I don't think I want them. I think um, obviously never say never. Maybe I'll change my mind right. at some point. But right now it's not, not in my plan. I got the clue because you had mentioned earlier uh, about your mom in business, that it's a serious thing, that everybody needs to be quiet, so business is not for kids. And so I'm like, okay, maybe you're in that that season of your life or that state where you're like, I need to focus on that performance and building something that's going to have long-term impact towards my goal and be complete alignment. So for people who don't have kids, who are contemplating it, they often underestimate the amount of work and compromises and dedication it takes to, to raise children properly. Uh, otherwise, you're an absentee parent. And so yeah. if you have this big, ambitious goal, you have to take that into consideration, like how it's going to change your life. Because if you look at it, it's not going to change anything. You're probably not doing it right. That's just my opinion. My husband and I, when we got married, when we were 25, I think we kind of just assumed mm-hmm. that we would have kids. But it's probably mm-hmm. another one of those situations where we were going down the path expected of us, like going to college or going to sixth form or, you know, like going into a job and it was like oh when are we going to have kids and then when we actually talked about it we were like do you want to have kids no do you no and then it was like oh okay well then we're not going to do it and it was quite freeing just being like let's actually confront this thing that we're meant to do and decide that we're going to go a different way it's been a pleasure talking to you jody Uh, i i see you've learned your lesson of not naming your new company jc coaching uh, AI yes. that we yeah. graduated from using your initials in that pattern. We've talked about so many fun things that I just feel like there's so many common things that we can sit here and talk all day around. I, I just want to wish the best for you. I, I know that you're actively competing in powerlifting competitions. What's the next big thing for you? Next big thing in powerlifting is I have a competition in December, um, a full power one in England, not usually in England in winter but let's see how that goes and then apart from that we've got a bunch of coach fox ai spaces opening up because we are launching them in spaces of in 250 batches at a time so we're all gearing up to welcome in the next wave of creators so that's what i'm excited about in the kind of short term wonderful that's a is that an oversubscribed concept there guess it is yeah i guess i learned that from uh, someone who we know (laughs) pretty well yeah so there are only 250 slots. How often do these things open up? Um, at the moment, we're doing them once every two months. It may move to once a month. Maybe at some point we'll be evergreen, but we are very much enjoying the oversubscribe model right now because it means that we can we can look after everyone. It's definitely a thing it that's could. come from the agency to software 
shift. It's like very different having creators and lots of different creators compared to clients. And they're obviously worth a very different amount per month. But we still apply the agency mindset of like, we look after everyone. If you lose a client, it's a really big deal. You will look like we're making sure everyone has a really good time. So we're applying that here. Hence only opening 250 spaces at a time. Is it safe to assume that you are like, as as Blair would say, eating your own dog food? Is there a Jody bot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a Jody AI. It's the one we made first to test if it was even possible. It teaches people about productivity, about running an agency, about how to exit your company, about all those types of things. And then we started playing around with that, training it, doing all that kind of stuff before we decided that it was ready to become a system that we put other people through and created more creators based on. And now, I mean, the um, Jody AI is very much a kind of business AI coach, but we've got We've got an astrologer, we've got a recruitment coach, we've got a a marriage coach. There's all different types of people. And I just love the idea that anyone could have their kind of business and personal board of AI coaches in the future. And anytime they need anything, it's like, we'll just go and get help. And it's like, no question is is too stupid. And even if it is stupid, it doesn't matter because you're not asking a real person. Okay, honest assessment here. Real life Jody, 10. What would you grade AI Jody or Jody AI? Will be a 10 one day. Has the potential 100%. I think it's because we are training it more and more to understand nuance. And I feel like that's the big challenge with AI models at the moment. They they maybe generalize. Um, sometimes they kind of don't necessarily follow a story through. Um, and they might want to repeat something that they've already said. Um, so one day a 10, not there yet, but it's a it's the infinite game, I guess. What's the number you would place it today? How far away are we from that 10? Oh, I don't know. Would I say a six or a seven? Because I think that if you if you go and talk to an AI coach expecting it to be exactly like a human, then you're going to be like, what the hell is this? But if you go to it expecting it to be having like a journaling session with someone's content, you get so much out of it. And then we ran quite a few tests because we wanted to have like a cohort of clients of Jody AI who we recorded, how many times they spoke to it, what they spoke about and how much difference it made to their life. And so there were people getting really cool results out of it because they're approaching it in that way. Um, so I feel like it's a bit of a it's a bit of an expectation thing as well with what someone goes to it with and what someone talks to it about. But do you see that in the very near future that it'll get to a certain point where it would be nearly indistinguishable from you? Because it's all about passing the Turing test, right? So yeah. if you truly believe that you are speaking to a person compared to a, like a, a chatbot and the Turing test for our models is getting later and later like it's it's getting later and later in the conversation so maybe it would have at one point failed the Turing test within three interactions now it's six or 10 or 15 and one of our goals is to make it happen even later and later so that someone could be talking about okay I've got this problem and then it links to this problem but also I want to circle back and I want to look at this other option. The kind of chatbot keeps up to date with that. That's like a, that's a big goal. Um, I think that a hard thing to work out is all these chemicals that you release talking to a human, like, is it serotonin? And it's like all the different kind of togetherness hormones. Will you ever get them from a, from a AI, from like an AI version of a person, even if it's a person, you know, and like, and Tristan, you know, it's been built with love. Will you get that? And we kind of joked about like sending a cuddly toy for every <laughs> Jody AI user. So you can almost like cuddle it and chat at the same time and seeing if that would um. happen. But I'm very interested in the research that will come out around that and seeing how much in the future it will matter that you're not releasing those closeness hormones that you would with a human and whether because it's so convenient and it costs so much less and it's always available will that just completely take away the need for the human element i think we're already there it's just only going to get better because i've people have shared their experiences working with dobot and saying they're literally crying talking to it that's a, that's a genuine human emotion reaction and of course they're in a very vulnerable state so they're going to cry talking to anybody but one thing that we we try to get Dobot to do is to be more of a coach, less of a mentor. So it's just going to ask you lots of questions. In our society today, like everybody wants to talk. And so our ability to be heard is getting less and less. And so anybody, anything that just takes a moment to try to listen to you, to empathize with what's going on and to get you to share your own thoughts, I think is going to build an emotional reaction. I think so. It's like um, there's a Black Mirror episode 
that's called Be Right Back. And it's where a lady's partner dies and she uses artificial artificial intelligence to kind of rebuild him. She first starts off texting him and then they work out how to clone his voice so she's talking with him and then eventually they kind of bring him to life in like a like a model but it's not really him but it kind of is him and it's quite interesting to see how I know it's fiction but it's quite interesting to see how she almost doesn't care that she knows it's it's not real she knows it's not real but because it fills a gap because it staves off loneliness She's totally happy to let it in. And I wonder if that's what we're seeing with like Dobot and with Jodie AI and with all the different AI creators that that we're making. If it solves the problem of you getting help, does it even matter that it's not real? And I guess not. I don't think so. I mean, reality, I, f- I think for a large part of us, it's a construct. It's like that theme that is played within the Matrix series where do you think this is real? Do you think that's a yes. steak that you're eating or a woman that you're embracing or a dog that you're petting? Is that real? Maybe we're all in the matrix and we'll wake up one day realizing we're connected to some supercomputer. I'm so glad that you mentioned The Matrix because I rewatched it again the other day and I feel like now more than ever that movie is so relevant. So if you haven't watched The Matrix in a while, (laughs) get it up on Netflix, have a look because it's just, it's very now and it's quite scary how they kind of predicted a lot of stuff that's going on or could go on very soon. Well, on that note... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's time for us to wrap this episode. Uh, my, my guest has been Jody Cook. She's been amazing. We've been talking about raising entrepreneurial children. We talked about like how you can befriend a writer perhaps on, at one of these publications. And if you do it with the spirit of generosity, building real meaningful relationship, building rapport, try not to ask for things, build natural relationships that will lead to other opportunities. And we've been geeking out over a little bit about our own AI endeavors and how it could help further our mission and our vision and our goals. And all I want to say to you is, as we're both focused on performance, I'll see you at the top, Jody. Thank you so much. See you at the top. How do people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about what you're doing, especially Coach Fox? They can find Coach Fox at coachfox.ai. You can meet Jodie AI there you're very welcome to chat to her sometimes it feels weird saying her it her it will go with her um and then everything that I write about and talk about is at jodiecook.com so j-o-d-i-e-c-o-o-k.com or say hey on twitter thanks very much I am Jodie Cook and you are listening to the future 